Hello, everyone. Welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is finally our last lesson on airlock, Canadian Aviation Regulations. It is the review. It is the Coles Notes version of everything you've learned so far. We're going to spend approximately one slide on every lesson, and it's uh, pretty much death by PowerPoint. I talk, and uh, you follow along on the uh, point form. So let's get started. There are recency requirements for pilots. A pilot must have acted as a pilot in command within the last five years. They must complete recurrent training every two years and do five takeoffs and landings during the day or night within the last six months of carrying passengers. A private pilot may act as a pilot in command or second in command of any aircraft if endorsed or not endorsed if during flight training or supervised by an instructor. A pilot license is kept valid by a medical certificate with a validity period of 60 months, five years, for a pilot under 40 years of age or 24 months, two years, if the pilot is over 40 years of age. Aerodromes must have a windsock or wind direction indicator. On an aerodrome, so a registered aerodrome, it is orange. On an airport, so a certified aerodrome, it is striped. The windsock is straight at 15 knots. Class A airspace is for IFR traffic only. It is in, uh, generally between 18,000 feet and 60,000 feet. Class B is controlled VFR and IFR only between 12,500 feet and up to 18,000 feet. You require clearance to go into Class B con, uh, airspace. Class C includes control zones. You require a clearance to enter a Class C control zone. A Class D control zone, you just need to advise ATC. Class E is miscellaneous controlled airspace, such as low-level airways and control zones when the control tower is closed. So a Class C or D control zone becomes Class E when the control zone is closed. VFR do not require a clearance in Class E airspace. Class F airspace is special use, such as military. You get the details uh, by looking at NOTAMs or a map. Class G is uncontrolled. Carry-on baggage, equipment, and cargo must be secure. For a day VFR flight, you need enough time, uh, fuel to fly to the destination, plus have 30 minutes. At night, you must add 45 minutes. You must account for all possible weather, ATC, and other possible delays. You must uh, provide passengers a passenger briefing on the location and operation of exits, seatbelts, emergency equipment, and how to secure their luggage. Visual flight rules is, are the flight rules that you will be flying under most likely as a private pilot. Different types of airspace have different weather minima for visual flight rules. Controlled airspace requires three miles visibility, 500 feet vertically to cloud, and one mile horizontally to cloud. In a control zone, you have to be 500 feet above the surface. In uncontrolled airspace above 1,000 feet, you I have to have one mile of visibility by day, three miles by night. You must be 500 feet vertically to cloud and 2,000 feet horizontally. In uncontrolled airspace below 1,000 feet, you require two miles visibility now during the day, but you only have to be clear of cloud. Special VFR is valid in a control zone only and requires authorization. While special VFR, you may fly in one statue mile visibility, clear of cloud. VR4 over the top, uh, requires five miles visibility and a thousand feet vertically to cloud. You must be 5,000 feet between layers. At the destination, you can't have a ceiling below 3,000 feet, five miles visibility. You can't have thunderstorm or precipitation from one hour prior of the ETA to two hours after the ETA if using the TAF or using a GFA three hours after. A flight plan is required when flying beyond 25 nautical miles. If you are flying into the United States, or in the air defense identification zone. You are considered overdue if you are one hour past your ETA on a flight plan or more than 24 hours past your ETA on a flight itinerary. A flight itinerary can be filed with any responsible person. You must make amendments to your flight plans as soon as possible, and you must advise ATC or the Joint Rescue Coordination Center if, over, if an aircraft is overdue. When operating near an aerodrome, you don't take off or land if there is a risk of collision. The aerodrome must be suitable and you must conform to the traffic pattern. The standard pattern is a left-hand circuit, so all turns are to the left. 
You must maintain a listening watch on the radio and communicate with air traffic control. You must take off and land into the wind and not overfly an aerodrome at less than 2,000 feet above the ground. If you're equipped with a radio, you must maintain a listening watch on the radio. You must make radio calls directed at a specified ground station or broadcast to the traffic in the area if there is no ground station. For example, you would call Winnipeg Tower or you could call Bancraft Traffic. You must broadcast your intentions prior to entering the maneuvering area and broadcast departure intentions prior to taking position. You must report clear of the circuit. On arrival, you must report prior to entering the mandatory frequency area or five minutes if circumstances permit, joining the circuit on downwind, final and clear of the runway. When flying continuous circuits, you must report on downwind, on final and clear of the runway. You must report prior to entering the MF area and once clear of the MF area. Radar service does not relieve the pilot of traffic separation responsibility. Remember as a pilot in command, everything is your responsibility. The standard VFR transponder squat code is 1200 and above 12,500 feet, it is 1400. The transponder identification feature on your transponder makes you your aircraft flash on the ATC radar screen. You press this ident button only when directed by ATC. Air traffic control provides traffic information by using the clock system. For example, nine o'clock means it's off your right side. An ATC instruction is a directive issued by ATC that must be complied with as long as flight safety is not jeopardized. A clearance, such as clear to take off and clear to land, is an authorization by ATC to proceed. At a controlled airport, you need a clearance for everything, but you can join the circuit as cleared by ATC. You want to contact air traffic control prior to joining the circuit. At an uncontrolled airport, you must join the circuit either on a downwind or overhead the field. All controlled airports have mandatory frequencies and you ha must have a radio and talk on them. Some controlled uncontrolled airports have mandatory frequencies and some have aerodrome traffic frequencies where you do not need to talk on the radio. However, if you have a radio, it is strongly encouraged that you use the radio to broadcast the traffic. You want to monitor the frequency 126.7 en route to provide position reports and keep abreast of other traffic in the area. If you have a second radio, monitor the emergency frequency of 121.5 for any aircraft in distress. Aircraft require a flight authority, such as a certificate of airworthiness on board. They also require the aircraft flight manuals. All markings and placards designated in the type certificate data sheet must be in place, and all equipment that affects the safety of the flight must be serviceable. Let's talk about aircraft equipment requirements. For day VFR, you require an altimeter, airspeed indicator, magnetic compass, tachometer, oil pressure gauge, oil temperature gauge, fuel gauge, and a timepiece. Night VFR requires the day VFR instrumentation, plus the heading indicator, turn coordinator, and lights. And for VFR over the top, you need the night equipment, plus an attitude indicator, radio, navigation aids, and pitot heat. All aircraft require seatbelts. You must, the passengers must wear seatbelts for taxi, takeoff, and landing, or whatever the pilot command says so. Oxygen is required between 10 and 13,000 feet for flights greater than 30 minutes, or whenever your flight is above 13,000 feet. You require a transponder in any transponder airspace. You can find this transponder airspace in the designated airspace handbook, but it is also on VNC net maps quite often. The ELT can be tested at the first five minutes of every hour. If your ELT accidentally activates, you must notify air traffic control as soon as possible. Aircraft must be equipped with normal emergency checklists, current charts of IFR or VFR over the top, a current database if using GPS, fire extinguisher, time peaks, such as a watch, flashlight if flying a night, and a first aid kit. You must also have survival equipment for appropriate for the number of persons geographic area and season. But you do not require a survival kit if you're within 25 nautical miles of your point of departure. And there is a radio in the area of the time of the year where survival is not jeopardized. Life preservers and uh, flotation devices are required when beyond gliding distance of land or 50 nautical miles without a life preserver. Life rafts and survival equipment uh, over, are uh, required when 20, operated 25 nautical miles from shore. 
all radios must be able to transmit on the emergency frequency of 121.5. Intercept orders are found in the Canada Flight Supplement, and they are used when you are being intercepted by military aircraft. However, they will contact you first on 121.5. Flights around the perimeter of Canada are within what's called the Air Defense Identification Zone. All flights within this ATIS require a flight plan. The Minister of Transport can shut down all airspace, and that is referred to as the SCAP plan. This, occurred, this can occur during times of war or most recently on September 11th. Following any maintenance work, all aircraft require a maintenance release signed by an aircraft maintenance engineer in the aircraft logbooks. Pilots and owners can do elementary work on their aircraft. This includes tire changes, oil changes, and filter changes. Aircraft must be maintained in accordance with an approved maintenance schedule for private operators. This maintenance schedule is found in CAR 625, Appendix B and C. You must inspect your aircraft ever after any abnormal occurrence. This must be done by an AME, or it may be done by a pilot if the inspection does not require any maintenance. So for example, you do not need to open any panels and make an, an external inspection. An example of this would be, let's say that you thought you ran over something with your wheel. You can inspect the wheel yourself and look at it yourself and make sure that it is still in suitable condition. The journey logbook contains particulars for each flight and all maintenance activities. It must be carried on board the aircraft. A technical logbook must contain the particulars of all maintenance and it cannot be carried aboard the aircraft. Also on board the aircraft, you require proof of liability insurance. All incidents must be reported to the Transportation Safety Board of Canada. The, you are not allowed to move or disturb any accident site except for the purposes of preserving life, property, and the environment. That concludes our review on the Canadian Aviation Regulations. You've now sat through 20 lessons of air law. This is without a doubt, probably the most boring subject that you will have to endure in this ground school, but you've made it this far. I have no doubt you'll be able to make it through the rest of the ground school. Thanks for joining me.